You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Leah Bustan of Princeton University. Leah, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. So Leah is the author of a new study entitled The Effects of Immigration on the Economy, Lessons from the 1920s Border Closure, along with four other co-authors. She's been doing quite a bit of research in the area of the age of migration and, and migration more generally. So that's going to be our topic for today. So Leah, why don't you start by giving some context for this latest paper? It's focused on a particular event, the 1920s law um, on immigration. So could you give some background on on that law and uh, things that listeners should know about it if they're going to understand this research? Sure. We were inspired to look at the 1920s border closure because it is the largest change in immigration policy in U.S. history. Before the early 1920s, the U.S. border was almost entirely open to immigrants from Europe. And at that time, around a million immigrants arrived in the U.S. each year. And to put that in perspective, the U.S. population was a little under 100 million. So uh, the immigration flow was quite large. In the early 1920s, the U.S. imposed a series of immigration quotas, and really for the first time. These quotas uh, eventually, over the course of the 20s, they were refined, cut the immigration flow to 150,000 a year. So almost by an order of magnitude. And we were interested in learning more about how the economy adapted to such a major change in immigrant inflow, both to understand this really central episode in U.S. history, but also, I think, because of proposals in the U.S. and other countries uh, re more recently to cut immigration and sometimes quite drastically. So if you want to understand how the economy would adapt to such a big change, it's challenging to find another context as large. And so that's what sort of encouraged us to drill down a bit on the 1920s law. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're trying to sort of empirically study these things, you want a big, dramatic and sudden change so you can sort of look at the before and after and have a good sense of causation. Gradual changes uh, don't cut it, often beset with uh, too much noise to tell if, uh, you know, the change in... Uh, in the number of immigrants is is causing economic changes or vice versa but something like this it's it's nice it's clean as as a as identification goes and uh and so you can get a really good sense of the the impact of of uh of this really drastic restriction in in migration well one really useful mm -hmm. feature of this law change is that it was not simply an across the board cut for immigrant flows, but the law was set up to be specific for each sending country. So some sending countries were hardly affected by the law at all. Um, and actually, some countries were completely exempted. And other countries had their immigration flow cut by 90, 95%. So the law was really targeted against uh, what were considered at the time new sending countries from Southern and Eastern Europe, like Italy, Russia, Poland, and so on. And why that's a useful feature for us empirically is that we can take advantage of the fact that some local areas in the U.S. had large clusters of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, and other places had a similar foreign-born population, but their foreign-born population came from a, a different set of sending countries, most importantly, Germany, Ireland, Britain and Canada. So these were countries that were either entirely excluded or while they were included uh, so that a quota was set for that country, the quota was in some cases almost entirely non-binding. Mm. So you can look at the variation in local labor markets or local places in the U.S. based on whether their immigrant population was, was restricted or not. Right. And I, I think one example that can help wrap your minds around how this works is to think about a place like Madison, Wisconsin. So Wisconsin is sort of notorious or was well known for having a large German population. So at the time, Madison 
had sort of a, a median share of the population foreign born, but most of their, of those foreign born residents had been born in Germany. And you can compare that to a nearby city, a city that's in the same general region in the U.S., like Youngstown, Ohio. So a medium sized city with a medium share foreign born, but the foreign born population in Youngstown was much more heavily concentrated to Southern and Eastern Europeans. So Madison is, is, uh, scarcely affected by the policy in Youngstown is substantially affected. Now, this is not a policy that deports existing residents, but it just means that the future flow of, um, of inflow of migrants is almost entirely dried up for some locations in the U.S. And then we can see how the local economy adapts. Right, right. So for some context, it's not that it's, you know, mechanistic that people from Germany must move to Madison, but it, it's that you, when you're deciding to move, you don't want to just land in the middle of a foreign country where you don't speak the language and don't know anyone and have no community. You want to go where other people like you who speak your language have, you know, who are, are maybe Catholic uh, or share some cultural traits with you, or maybe are even pe members of your extended family who, who can help you uh, get started. So if you cut off immigration from Eastern Europe, the places where there are already communities of Eastern Europeans will have the flow cut off. Whereas if there's already a community of Western Europeans or Germans, that flow will not be cut off to that place, correct? Right, exactly, Garrett. So it doesn't have to be through any kind of iron law that local areas that w were more Southern or Eastern European to begin with were necessarily more affected by this policy. But because of those uh, patterns of friend and family chain migration, streams, then it turns out that those were the areas that were most affected. And that's something we have to check in the data. We, we can maintain that as an assumption, and then we can take a look at inflows to these local areas before and after the policy change, before and after the border closure. And we see that, as we would expect, it is the local areas that initially had larger clusters from Southern and Eastern Europe that end up having greater declines in their immigrant inflow in the 1920s relative to a period beforehand of open immigration. Okay. So what are the the outcomes you want to study by looking at this? Uh, obviously, obviously, people are interested in, you know, the wage effects of, of migration. What else do you look at? Well, we started the paper with a puzzle that at this point is actually becoming relatively well known, at least in the economic history literature. So uh, you mentioned at the beginning that this is a paper with four other co-authors. Uh, two of them, Philip Ager and Casper Worm Hansen, have an earlier uh, working paper that documents that local areas that were more exposed to the border closure, you would think by simple economic theory that the U.S. workers in those areas would see their earnings rise after the border closes and th those workers would no longer have to compete with foreign arrivals. But in fact, Philip and Casper document that U.S. born workers in those areas see their earnings fall. And that was really quite puzzling. In another paper that was being worked on concurrently, uh, Marco Tabellini found the same thing. And so this paper that we're talking about today is sort of jumping off from a empirical regularity that's been noted by Philip and Casper and also by Marco, which was quite surprising, at least from a basic theory perspective. Why would it be that U.S. born workers in areas that had been receiving a lot of immigrant inflows and suddenly had those immigrant inflows cut off, why would their earnings fall? If to the extent that U.S. workers and, and foreign workers are competing, they're substitutes in the labor market, and now suddenly labor supply has reduced in those areas, you would think that if anything, a U.S. born earnings would go. Now, I just want to have a caveat first for anyone who you know, hasn't worked with historical data, but instead is more familiar with modern census data or CPS. And you might think, well, okay, what we do is we base our results on surveys that ask residents, what was your annual earnings last year? 
How many hours did you work? How many weeks did you work? Those are questions that were added to government surveys and added to the census from 1940 onward. So from our time period, we do not have wage and income information at the individual level. So the puzzle that I allude to is using like a poor man's proxy for uh, wage and income data, which is an occupation-based earnings measure. So what we do have in the census at that time was the occupation that the person reports engaging in. So that could be something very low skilled, like a common laborer, a porter, a dock worker. It could be sort of a medium skill, blue collar work uh, position, like an operative, a machinist or a trade type position, like a bricklayer. It could be something in the white collar world or a, it could be a farmer or a farm laborer. Uh, there's around uh, 200 occupations that are you know, well reported in the census. And so then each occupation gets assigned uh, the median earnings for people in that occupation. So when to the extent that we see earnings go up or go down, that's really a way of saying that workers are moving up or down the occupational ladder. So just to restate the puzzle again, now that we know what the measure is, in local areas, that had a reduction in immigrant inflow, the U.S. workers in those areas, on average, were moving down the occupational ladder. And that's going to show up in our measure as, as an earnings cut. Right. And, okay. you know, that struck, struck us as quite puzzling. So what we set out to do in this paper is to try to understand what were the economic adaptations that were going on in these local labor markets such that an earnings cut would make sense. So... The immigration quota is really just starting the whole process in motion. And the first thing that happens is that immigration into these areas declines. But firms, employers, and in rural areas, farm owners, landowners, don't necessarily stop there. When they see that their low-skilled labor supply has been reduced, they can shift into other types of factors. They might hire more U.S.-born workers. They might invest in more capital. And they also might realize that the immigration policy was not applied to Canada and Mexico. So there's other pools of immigrant workers that they could tap into that were not covered by the policy. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we uh, set out to look at. So originally your question, and I I've been talking for a few minutes now, mm -hmm. was about what other outcomes are we looking at? And those are the outcomes of interest to us are inflows of other factors of production, whether it be capital or other sources of labor. So, so the, the big question is how do employers or you know, firms shift their behavior in response to a cutoff of immigration? Do they, do they invest in more capital? Do they hire Canadians? Um, I'm Canadian, so that <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> relevant to me, uh, sort of, uh, although, you know, it's a hundred years ago, so not really, but, uh, or an alternative is they you could pick up your firm and move somewhere else uh, or, or shut it down entirely. There's really a lot you could do in response to a change in your labor force, and uh, and you can measure some of those measure some of those changes, or, which is interesting. So part of the whole like immigration, I mean the the other aspect of immigration, it it doesn't seem that surprising to me that wages would fall uh, just because immigrants. They supply labor and they demand goods and services, which you need labor to to generate. So to, at least in my mind, to a first approximation, if you imagine a really simple model where everyone is identical and just uh, they make stuff and they consume stuff locally, then an, an immigrant should have no impact on on wages. You know, and then, of course, of course, that's the, the most simple sort of uh, way of thinking about it. But a lot of a lot of the time people who know little econ sort of think of it in terms of just the supply and demand for labor, not looking at the demand for goods. And, and to them, it seems like the, the obvious thing is for wages to fall. But you, you've shown that wages to fall in response to more immigration, you've shown that wages fall in response to less immigration, the opposite effect. So uh, yeah. Uh, do you want to comment right, on that? So let me give you a sense of what we think is going on, starting with the urban parts of the country. So we subdivide the U.S. into urban and rural areas. Hmm. And in urban areas, what we find is that when immigrants stop coming into a location after the border closure, 
other workers come in to that area in equal measure. So some of those inflows are of U.S. born workers from other parts of the country that are now moving in, like maybe moving from Madison to Youngstown, Ohio, for example, in the, the case that I was giving you earlier. And some of them are coming from Mexico and Canada. So the puzzle started with this idea of there's been a decline in labor supply. So why aren't wages going up? And in reality, there was no decline in labor supply because mm. there was such a strong in-migration response of other worker types to the areas that were exposed that it undid all of the labor supply decrease from the policy. And that's a bit surprising in the modern context because this is sort of the equivalent or maybe you'd say the opposite of a set of literature in modern labor economics about native displacement, which with the idea being if immigrants move into a, a local area, like maybe immigrants from Cuba move into Miami through the Mariel boat lift, for example, in the early 80s, then they may compete with U.S. born workers for a while. After six months or a year of something like this, U.S. born workers realize that the labor market prospects in Miami are not that great. So they move to Tampa. In doing so, they kind of spread the shock of the immigration inflow that started in Miami to the rest of the country. But what that does is that Miami is really not, in the end of the day, that different from Tampa in terms of the treatment that those two cities received in a labor supply increase. So people have looked at that question in, in the modern data and posed that as a hypothesis and have not found altogether too much. And of course, it depends study by study. And as in any empirical setting, you know, the best description of the literature is to say the results are mixed because certainly there are studies that find some displacement and some that don't find any at all. But I would say that the kind of best summary of that modern literature is that there's not very much labor uh, displacement going on in, in modern case. But here we're sort of looking at the opposite experiment. What if you take, what if you cut off future immigrant inflow? Uh, do other workers respond by moving into those places? And the answer is that they do. And it's one for one. I mean, it's literally one for one. So then the, the existing workforce in those places really were not exposed to a labor supply change in terms of just numbers of bodies. What ended up happening is that the uh, in-migrants were higher skilled on average than the people who were no longer coming in. Many of the immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe at the time were, uh, let's say, the equivalent of a fourth grade education. So some were literate, some were illiterate, but those that were literate were not really that much further beyond basic literacy. So they were holding very low skilled positions. And if we break down the occupational groups of immigrants who are no longer coming in to these areas into just four very aggregated categories, low skilled blue collar workers, higher skilled blue collar workers, white collar and farm workers. So those are the four basic categories. We see that almost all of the immigrant losses are coming in the low skilled blue collar category. Mm -hmm. Many of them are common laborers and so on. And then the inflows are sort of distributed between the low skilled and the higher skilled blue collar categories. So the newcomers that are coming in, especially the U.S. born newcomers, are more likely to be in that higher skilled group. So now if you think about the existing workers who are sitting in Youngstown, Ohio, they don't have to compete as much with immigrants. Now they actually have to compete with U.S. born. And the U.S. born are more likely to be, let's say, eighth grade education, more likely to be operatives, more likely to be foremen. And those might have been the jobs that the uh, U.S. born in Youngstown were doing before the border closed. So if you were thinking about this from the perspective of a policymaker and you were thinking the U.S. economy as a whole, now the welfare analysis is really not that clear because these newcomers are coming from somewhere. Maybe they're coming from Madison. Maybe they're coming from a rural area and engaging in kind of rural to urban migration, but they're, they're surely better off than where they were before. Otherwise, they would not have engaged in such a move. So those newcomers are benefiting from the quota. Mm. They are finding jobs in manufacturing type cities they may not have had before. But the existing residents of places like Youngstown that had large immigrant populations um, are losing because they're competing with these newcomers from the rest of the U.S. So it's really not obvious what the overall welfare analysis would be there from the policymaker perspective. Another way of thinking about the paper, though, is forget about the perspective of the U.S. as a whole and just treat each 
urban area as if it's sort of an isolated economy. This is more of a labor economics way of thinking about things. Imagine that you can uh, treat these economies in isolation and think, okay, what do we learn from a hundred cities that are exposed about what would happen to a country that closes the border? And in that sense, I think that the takeaways from the paper are a little bit more clear. I mean, here we see, imagine you're a policymaker that closes down entry to Youngstown from abroad. What happens? Well, there's other sources of labor supply that local firms can rely on. So it's not obvious that your local workers are the ones that are going to benefit. If there's other forms of substitution on the table, and today that could be outsourcing, offshoring jobs, Mm-hmm. Or, and we'll eventually get into talking about capital, it could be automation and mechanization. But then it's not so clear that local firms are going to say, oh, my hands are tied. I used to hire immigrants, but now I'm just going to hire a local worker when they have other opportunities to substitute. Yeah. So uh, another analogy would be, what if you had a competitive market and you put a uh, quota on just one firm, right? This firm being the analogy to Eastern European labor you'd just expect the other firms to new firms to enter other firms to to increase production you wouldn't you'd expect a lot of the effect to be washed out but as you point out these eastern europeans had different traits than the the other migrants so they they changed the composition of the labor force from in order and made it so there were less low fewer low skilled people and more high skilled people right and There's another group that we haven't talked about too much yet, which are Mexicans. And Mm -hmm. this is a group that I really did not hear much discussion in the policy debate before the border closure. It seems like policymakers were not really aware of the fact that there was a potential for inflow from Mexico. And so what we find is, like I mentioned, for every immigrant that's no longer coming into a place like Youngstown, there's one new worker coming in from somewhere. Well, 30% of that new inflow is from Mexico. Hmm. And that was not what policymakers were thinking about. And of course, those in migrants were very low skilled. So some of the low skilled jobs were replaced, but not all of them. So could you could you just give some background on that? What was the was there a relatively open border with Mexico in 1920? When did the as, as we know from today, eventually migration from Mexico to the United States was severely restricted, but it hadn't happened yet, to be clear. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. It's really fascinating and surprising from our modern perspective that as of 1921, the border between the U.S. and Mexico was almost entirely unrestricted. So even after the quota system was enacted, Mexico was not included on the list of countries on which a quota was imposed. So in theory, any number of Mexicans could still enter the U.S. In practice, and almost ironically, both the southern and northern border started to be patrolled more heavily after the 1921 law in order to prevent illegal entry from Europe. So the idea was maybe someone would come from Italy and transit through Mexico or transit through Canada and then just cross the border. So in order to really enforce the quotas from Europe, We need to have border checkpoints. We need to have border patrol. And both of those activities ramped up over the course of the 1920s. So Mexican migrants needed to enter through an official checkpoint. It used to be that uh, before the law, um, there was a blind eye turned to people who entered at any point along the border, even if they did not go through customs. But after 1921, there was much more enforcement of the idea that Mexicans also had to enter through the checkpoints and they had to put their name down. There was a medical inspection and a a shower and a sort of a de-lousing regime. So some of this was was, uh, considered very uh, dehumanizing. And so maybe there was a little bit of an extra impediment to crossing after 1921, but there was no quota in place. So in theory, the inflow could be unrestricted. And in fact, around half a million Mexicans entered over the course of the 1920s. Right. But they, if I recall correctly, they they both entered and left. It was they'd come in, work a while and then go back fairly frequently if, if I'm. If I'm thinking well, of the right time, it was a... 
back and There's forth, a little bit right? of that. So a, a large chunk of Mexicans did enter into rural areas and work as farm labor. So we haven't talked about the rural areas yet, and we can transition oh, yeah. to talking about them. But another portion did move into cities, and that's the piece that we're uncovering in this paper. Now, I often get this query, well, why aren't there then historical Mexican neighborhoods, like where is the little Mexico in Chicago or New York? And I think that the Mexican population really only started to appear in the 60s and 70s. And that is true to a large extent because, and there's another paper um, by Giovanni Perry and co-authors looking at the Mexican deportations of the 1930s. And so while these Mexican entry was legal and there was really no grounds for deportation on the sense that these entrants had been somehow skirting the law. During the Great Depression, there was a very large and concerted campaign to deport Mexicans, many of them from rural areas, but also from cities. And there were around 400,000 deportations in the 1930s. So a lot of the inflow that took place in the 20s may have taken root and then been the seed populations for much larger Mexican communities that would have spanned the whole 20th century, if not for the deportations that then took place. Right. And uh, my understanding is that once immigration from Mexico was restricted, it meant you, you no longer had a porous border with people moving both directions. It's just people would come one way and then knowing that they might not be able to get back if they left, they would stay for longer. That is very true, but that would be a more recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So between the 1920 arrivals, the 1930 departures, there's also this period from 1942 to 65 of the Mexican Bracero program. This was a guest worker program, around half a million entrants per year for mostly agricultural labor. And then those entrants would leave but they could come back again in the next season. So there, there were many Braceros who came to the U.S. repeatedly. Every year they would come and maybe work in the same place, but they would go home for a period of time. And that program was ended in 65. At that point, there was basically a conversion of what used to be formal Bracero labor into informal illegal entry that was relatively unrestricted and starts to, uh, the border starts to be policed more and more in the 80s and especially in the mid 90s. And at that point, it became more challenging to just leave, to visit family, to leave after the harvest season and come back in the next year. So then there's sort of a tough choice of, should I stay in the US on a more long-term basis or should I leave? And if I leave, it might be a more permanent leave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Rewinding back to 1920 again, you have mentioned the the effect on rural areas w was different from the effect on urban areas. So how did restricting immigration from Eastern Europe affect these rural labor markets? Right. So we might be surprised to hear today, but there was actually a fair number of Southern and Eastern European migrants that were working as farm labor, Portuguese, Italian, also other parts of Central Europe. And in fact, the agricultural industry was quite strong at lobbying against the border closure. And their fear was that they would lose this farm labor source. Ultimately, they were not successful at halting the border closure. And so after that point, we, we see that rural areas that already had concentrations of Southern and Eastern Europeans, you know, so the same sort of research design received fewer inflows from abroad in the 1920s relative to the period of open migration. So that is all the same as what we see in cities. But what's interesting is that unlike in cities where each immigrant that no longer comes in is matched with one arrival, we actually see that in rural areas, when immigrants stop coming in, so do other people, so do other workers from the rest of the U.S. The one exception is actually Mexico. So we see that there, when immigrants stop coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, there is some Mexican entry to the affected rural areas. But the inflows from the, of the U.S.-born workforce stop and reverse. So that's a, a bit surprising if you forget capital. So if you're just thinking about labor, substituting for each other, like, well, there are fewer immigrants here now. That should attract U.S. workers to take the jobs that immigrants have been doing before. Well, it turns out that farmers, landowners, um, instead of substituting from an Italian farm worker to a U.S. born farm worker, they instead substitute into capital. And we can see glimmers of this in the data. It's not 
the idea is not as ideal as, as one would like, but we can first see kind of a shift in crop mix away from the more labor intensive crops towards wheat, which was a very capital intensive crop. It was easy to plant and harvest by machine. And there was already an automated harvest for wheat. What was going on in the 1920s was the diffusion of the tractor, which helped to automate the planting and weeding sections of the cultivation cycle. And so ideally, we would like to have data on tractor adoption before and after the border closure. But we don't because the tractor was really only diffusing in large numbers starting around 1920. So the first data point we have from Census of Agriculture on tractor adoption is 1925. So that's already after the border closure. So instead, we document that in the 1920s, there's a strong negative relationship between using draft animals, mules and horses, and using tractors. So mules and horses is a data series that we have from before and after the border closure. And we can see that places that were more exposed, rural places that were more exposed to the quota policy and therefore received fewer farm laborers also shift away from horses and mules, which is a sign that they're probably shifting towards mechanization and the tractor, but we really can't say for sure. So that's a data problem. I'm just like at the beginning of our conversation we were talking about, unfortunately, we don't have wage data. We only have Mm occupation-based earnings. The same thing is true here. We don't have the real capital smoking gun that we would like, but it seems to be sort of consistent with what you would expect with the adoption of the tractor. And you also have population data. So you know there were fewer workers in those areas. We know there were fewer workers coming in, exactly. Mm -hmm. We know there are fewer immigrants coming in. We know that there are fewer U.S.-born workers coming in. And we can see that the one exception are Mexican farm laborers. So we do want to split. We haven't done this, but someone was just suggesting to us a few days ago, maybe farms in different parts of the country adapted differently. So maybe in the West and in the Southwest, there was this kind of labor replacement that we see in cities. So instead of hiring an Italian, you'd hire someone from Mexico. And maybe it's more in the the Midwest, the kind of corn and wheat belt, uh, where we see the adoption of, of machines instead. So we haven't done that kind of regional breakdown, but that would sort of make sense, I think. Right. Ba- based on how easy it is to mechanize the agriculture in the different regions? Well, yeah, based on both. So on the one, yes, like in the North, in the Midwest, it would be easier to mechanize the agriculture. And on the other hand, it's, you're farther from Mexico. So you would have had less of a, a pre-existing inflow from Mexico to establish some of those connections. On the flip side, if you're in the Southwest or California, you would have already maybe had some inflow from Mexico to establish a, a community. And then it would be easier to ramp that up. And the crops that are being grown there, whether it's fruit trees, whether it's cotton, whether it's vegetables, like those are harder to mechanize. Right. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting analysis. But I, I just want to, just because it's interesting, I want to I want to reiterate. So there's this restriction on migrants from Eastern Europe. And therefore, through a chain of causation, you see places where these migrants would have gone having less, fewer mules and horses working on farms, which uh, from which you can infer that they were using more tractors. It's, it's kind of amazing to me that the, the mule population would be affected in this, and yet it's so logical. <laughs> yes, the mule population was one of the most affected. It's true. This is actually <laughs> something that's consistent with work by Lou and Cater that came out last year. They were looking at the U.S. versus Canada and just focusing on the areas that were very close to the Canadian border. So this is going to be mostly winter wheat growing areas. And so they were looking at the tractor adoption in 1925 and 30. Um, like I mentioned, the data only starts in 25, but because they have the Canadian case as this counterpart, they're able to see that on the U.S. side of the border, there's actually faster adoption option of tractors and on the Canadian side slower because the Canada did not impose the same quotas. So that is very consistent with what we're finding, but because they have this Canadian counterpart, they're able to do their analysis with just the data from 25 and 30. So yes, I I think that someone was joking to me the other day, the group that we know is unambiguously benefited from the border closure are the tractor dealers. Huh. Yeah, I uh- you weren't kidding when you said uh, welfare analysis is hard, you know, just lo- looking at all these different 
impacts. And of course, it it matters who you in, include, right? Uh, as as with all welfare analyses, it's like who who gets included in welfare. If you include the mules, uh, clearly you wouldn't include the mules, but they're probably a lot of them got eaten as a result. Um, but if you include the tractor manufacturers, it's great for them. I think so. I recently had um, uh, Brian Kaplan and Zach Weiner. Smith on the show to talk about their uh, their book on open borders. Pretty clear if you include the welfare of immigrants themselves, you know, the people who were stuck in Poland because of this law, that uh, it's very bad law. Um, but then it's it's less clear if you only look at the people who are still, who, who are in America at the time, and some of them are better off, some of them are worse off. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah. I mean, it's always the case that if you take into account the welfare of the migrants themselves, that's going to dwarf any kind of secondary effects that you see on factors in the receiving area, whether it's labor yeah. or capital. And so I'm sure that that's true in this case as well, even though we didn't study that particular question. So I, here we're thinking about this, we sort of put the welfare analysis to the side, both because of course the migrants themselves are going to be the largest part of it. And also, like you say, it's just very complicated. There's some U.S. winners and some U.S. losers. But instead, we really want to emphasize the degree of ingenuity that landowners and, and firms and employers have in substituting away from immigrant workers to other sources of labor supply, other sources of capital. So it's just a cautionary tale for policymakers um, if they think that if you close the border, then there's one fewer immigrant taking a job, which means one more job for someone here who might vote for me. That's not so obvious, uh, given that there is a possibility of substituting into trade, uh, substituting into automation, into outsourcing and offshoring. So never discount the ingenuity of employers in, and firms in, in finding other sources um, of, of factors. Yeah, yeah. You you think that by restricting them from doing this one thing, they'll do this specific other thing that you want them to do. But uh, really, if, if you want firms to do something specific, like hire more workers, you, you just got to subsidize it. You got to just say, well, we'll pay you, we'll, we'll subsidize these wages, or, you know, we'll pay you this much per worker you hire uh, and pay this, you know, amount, uh, something like the earned income tax credit. If just, of course, which didn't exist yet at this time, would be the the thing that you would do that would directly target uh, um, American laborers. Um, so I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, your other research. So th this paper we've been discussing is part of a broader research program on the age of immigration. Um, so first, what is the age of immigration? I think uh, a lot of people have a have a focus on the the present day and maybe don't know about the the large immigrant waves of of the uh, of the past. So um, tell me about uh, about that and about your research research program more generally. Well, there was a headline in the New York Times last year, I believe, saying the U.S. population is now fifteen percent foreign born and it's the highest percent foreign born since nineteen ten. So it's been a century since we've had this many immigrants in the country relative to the population. And the reason why you have to stretch as far back as 1910 to find a number like this is because of the border closure that we've been discussing, because in 1920, future inflows, especially from Europe, were restricted. And if you look at the share of foreign born in the U.S. over a longer window, if you look over 150 years, you see this earlier period starting around 1860 and going to 1920, where 15% of the population is foreign born for over 50 years. So that really helps put into perspective the recent period. Okay, the U.S. population's 15% foreign born now. It's been 15% for a few years now, maybe. But what about 50 years, 50 years or, or more of a population that is that heavily concentrated with immigrants? Um, and that's the age of mass migration that we've been looking at. So up until this paper we've just been discussing, we've been focusing mostly on the immigrants themselves, actually. We've been looking at what is the economic return to migrating at the time, you know, namely, how much would you have earned if you stayed in Europe and how much would you earn in the U.S.? And therefore, how much value do the immigrants themselves get out of moving? We've looked at who from the European population chooses to move. So the Statue of Liberty tells us it's the poor, the tired, the huddled masses, meaning it's the lower end of the European 
skill distribution or income distribution that moves to the U.S. So we've been trying to look at that. And then once immigrants arrive in the U.S., how do they fare in the labor market and how do they compare to the U.S. born in terms of cultural practices as well? We've been looking at immigrants and also the children of immigrants in terms of those questions. So this is our first foray in the paper we just discussed in thinking about all right, you know, we're talking about 35 million entrants to the U.S. over this longer span of time. What did that mean to the U.S. economy? And what did that mean to the U.S. born? But up until now, we've been just focusing on the immigrants themselves. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that only now are are the foreign born percentages as high as they were. And of course, when the immigrants come and then they have kids, they are, they reduce the foreign-born percentage because their children are, of course, native-born at that point. Uh, but uh, one could one could argue about whether uh, whether percent foreign-born is the the you know the best or only measure of of uh, just how much immigration is happening. Uh, people who worry a lot about uh, changing culture might be concerned that uh, that. Well, back then they might be concerned that the immigrants are raising their children Catholic. Uh, nowadays, they they might be concerned about they'll they'd be concerned about other things. But the immigration today is in the context of a century of of severe restrictions, whereas the immigration then was in the context of basically open migration from most places. So, do, do you want to say a little bit about some of the broad patterns? Uh, I I gather that that these immigrants generally did, were much better off having moved than they would have been staying where they were. Yeah. So we estimate for the economic return to migrating to the U.S. at the time it was around 70, 75 percent increase in lifetime earnings, which definitely sounds like a lot. But if you put that into context, people are finding three or four hundred percent increase today. And that makes sense. You know, if you think about a world of open migration versus a world of much more constraint today, that constraint today is reducing labor supply from abroad. And if you're the one who, lucky migrant who gets to enter, you're facing less competition from other people who look just like you. And therefore, the potential earnings gain is quite large. In the past, you were one of many people from your home country m moving to the U.S. And that whole process of moving sort of has a general equilibrium effect. It's bringing in labor supply of a particular type and therefore pulling down the wage gain that any one worker would get. But still, it's a very large gain to moving. And who moves? Well, we're only able to look at that ourselves in the context of Norway. Other people have then followed up on our work to look at the UK and Ireland. Why only those countries? Well, what we're doing uh, is pretty data intensive. We need to follow people from a childhood census back in Europe to an adult census. And in the adult census, we need two of those, one in the home country and one in the U.S. So we look for you. We look for Leah Bustan, see if she's in the U.S. census or see if she's in the census of Norway. And if she's in the U.S. census, we call her a migrant. Then we go back to the childhood census and we say, what were the fathers of migrants versus the fathers of non-migrants doing in the labor market? What kind of occupations did they have? Are migrants coming from families where the fathers owned land and had some wealth? Were they coming from families that were more in terms of farm labor or common labor in cities? And we find that at the time, migrants were negatively selected. They came from the lower part of the skill distribution in terms of what their fathers did. And that's very much like what the Statue of Liberty did say. So now these are people who are lower skilled relative to their home country and they're coming to the U.S. How do they do when they, are, when they first arrive and then how much gain do they make um, in their occupations or earnings based, uh, occupation based earnings as they m spend more time in the U.S.? And here we have to follow people over many U.S. censuses, like they arrive in 1900, let's find them again in 1910 and find them again in 1920 in order to see what were they doing when they first got to the U.S. and then what were they doing after 10 and then after 20 years. And what we see is that, first of all, there's some immigrant sending countries that immigrants start out doing exceedingly well, sometimes even better than the U.S. born. And those are the countries mostly of Western Europe. So if you think about it in today's context, that would be as if we were pulling a lot of migrants today from Japan, Germany, Canada, other countries that were of equivalent development levels. 
to the U.S. today. If that was where most of our immigrants were coming from, you know, you wouldn't be that surprised to say, yeah, they kind of look like the typical U.S. born worker, or maybe even a little bit better. So there was a set of countries that looked like that. Then there was another set, mostly Southern and Eastern Europe, as well as Scandinavia, that started out looking like they were earning less than the U.S. born. And for those groups, there's some progress as they spend 10 or 20 years in the U.S. in terms of closing the earnings gap, but not very much. So very similar to today, where people find that immigrants start out with an earnings gap and close some of that gap over time, but not all of it in one generation. So to us, that sort of puts the modern results into context to say, this is something that's been going on for many periods in history that immigrants themselves do not actually catch up completely. But some new work we've done is on the children of immigrants relative to the children of the U.S. born. And there, I mean, we really were blown away by the similar patterns that we see in the past and the present where the children of immigrants are catching up to the children of the U.S. born. And this is going on even for sending countries that start out in the dad generation, not earning very much at all. Yeah, I I just, uh, you know, considering the, I'm just thinking about my personal experience uh, with people who have immigrant parents versus people who whose parents have been here their whole lives and maybe maybe for multiple generations. And just growing up and, and meeting people with different parents, it they really did not strike me as any different culturally. You know, they're they speak the language perfectly. They're they're in the same schools. It would actually be probably surprising to me if they're if they had persistent different outcomes after having been born in well, my experience is in Canada, but in the United States and being in the same areas. And unless there was some kind of other factor, like you know, if immigrants settled in poorer places or richer places, I would I would expect them to be different than the average person, but the same as the person in in their location. Well, I yeah. think that that's true, except we have to remember that the immigrant families are poorer on average, and yet the mm-hmm. kids are catching up to a large extent. So what that means is if you were to take a household that was equivalent in income, like so what we focus on in the paper just to like keep things simple is what about someone who's at the 25th percentile of the income distribution growing up? Um, so then you're going to expect that the children of immigrants are actually doing better than the children of the U.S. born if we're looking at folks in the same initial percentile of the distribution. And that's the sort of catch up that we see in the full sample, given that immigrants started out poorer. If there's catch up, it must mean that when we're looking at two people who are equivalent, the children of immigrants are doing better. And so that might be a little bit surprising. I mean, yes, like you're saying, the children of immigrants learn English fluently and native speaker. They go to U.S. public schools. And so why would you expect them to be any different? But what we're seeing is that they're doing a little better than someone who starts out at exactly the equivalent point. And so then we tried to kind of drill down on why that would be. And your intuition, Garrett, that it has something to do with location is actually completely correct. We find that most of this can be explained by where immigrants choose to settle. And so if we were to take two people from exactly the same county and compare them, then the kids of immigrants and the kids of the U.S. born pretty much look the same. But what's going on in the past is that immigrants are avoiding the U.S. South completely. The South was very rural, agricultural, cotton growing, a lot of sharecropping going on. This was not a place that um, you would necessarily move in order to get opportunity. A lot of U.S. born households are just born into the South, you know, so around 25, 30 percent of U.S. born whites live in the South at the time. Now, they can always choose to leave, but many of them don't. And so you have a set of the U.S. born that are kind of endowed with a Southern location and a set of immigrants who get to choose where to go. And they basically choose to avoid the South completely. And that gives them this mobility edge. Mm, Right. So I guess one other comparison you could do is immigrants versus Americans who have moved or whose parents moved at some point within the United States. So like, and then I I would expect them then you know, people, whether they're moving from Eastern Europe or, or Norway or from anywhere in the United States to anywhere else in the United States, 
I'd expect them to go to places where there are more opportunities. Okay, we're going to have to take Garrett on as a co-author on the next paper because all the questions <laughs> he's asking are exactly the ones that we were thinking up as well. So yes, we, we tried exactly that. And your, your intuition is completely correct that U.S. born households where the father was moving. And here we can see that because the census asks about state of birth. And so we can see was the child growing up in Illinois, but the father reports having been born in Kentucky. So that would be a father who moved. And we see that the the U.S. born fathers who engage in internal migration look much more similar to the immigrant fathers in terms of the ability for their sons to experience upward mobility. Okay, so I uh, anticipated your your future papers. Then that's fun. So we're we're just about out of time. Do you do you have uh, any sort of like closing thoughts or uh, like a general takeaway you'd like someone who's listened to this whole conversation to come away with it from it with? I just want people to be aware of the fact that the debates we're having today about immigration, should we close the border? Should we restrict immigration to only high-skilled countries or high-skilled people? What do immigrants do for the U.S. economy? How do they assimilate into U.S. society? These are exactly the same debates that uh, we were having in the early 20th century. And eventually they did lead to a drastic restriction in immigration. But I think we can really learn from this time period and hopefully this time around make policy that's a little bit more thoughtful because we have this experience of history. And on that note, uh, my guest today has been Leah Bustan. Leah, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio. If you want to learn more about this topic, you can go to economicsdetective.com, where I'll have show notes for the episode and links to the papers we discussed. I want to announce a milestone that the show recently hit. Uh, Recently, as in uh, last month, November of 2019, hit a half million total downloads. That's with 136, I believe, episodes. So you can do the math yourself about the the average number of downloads, but I'm really proud of uh, hitting hitting a half million, and I hope the next half million hap- happens even faster than this one did. If you want to discuss this episode or any other episode, you can join the Facebook group. That's Economics Detective on Facebook. It's a closed group, so you just need to answer a couple questions. But don't worry, it's not a, a national economy. We, we don't uh, restrict you based on arbitrary criteria or where you came from or what country you live in. So come join Economics Detective on Facebook and have a thoughtful discussion on this and other episodes. Thanks, and I'll be back soon. Thank you.